and God will give us whatever we ask because the asking will come out of our father-facing Abba type obedience and our alignment to his will like Jesus in Gethsemane. We'll be asking according to the father's will not for our own wants and our own needs. Now too many believers give in to temptation, seeking for power to satisfy their personal needs. Just as Jesus was tempted, make these stones bread so that you can have your hunger satisfied. No. So people are tempted at times to give in to this and to seek power and to seek God and to seek spirituality for what it will bring to you rather than seeking God for his own, own sake. That's father-facing obedience. That's what it should be, to seek God for who he is. Now, we do know that when we obey the Father's will with gospel obedience, we find that he meets our needs and we are satisfied as well. But it's often short-term pain and denial leading to long-term satisfaction as opposed to the pleasures of sin which are fleeting and seasonal and transitory and superficial. We turn our back on the me, yes, now, gratify me immediately, society, and we move towards the not my will, but your will be done, the father-facing Abba obedience. This is, of course, only possible by the Spirit's power. All true obedience must be Spirit-enabled obedience. It's the work of the Spirit to sanctify us, to bring us into the likeness of Christ, that we might live according to the family name. And our obedience to the Father's will is crucial if the Spirit is to develop the Father's nature in us. And so spiritual experiences, spiritual gifts and everything else by way of our relationship with God are only valuable if they express our Gethsemane obedience. In other words, it's only as we have first said yes to Abba, Father, your will, not my will be done. Only then can true spirituality operate. Only then can spiritual gifts truly and genuinely operate out of our lives in the God-intended way. For gospel obedience is the willingness to follow Jesus from the garden to the cross. That's what gospel obedience is. Abba obedience. In practice, this means being ready like Jesus in the garden to follow him in the absence of signs and wonders or anything else that, is, that can be there at times to make us feel good or look good. It means that we will follow Jesus in the garden to, preserve, to persevere even when everything is dull and difficult and dark. When we give way to God's will so that much fruit can grow. When we defy our fears and stand for Christ by our words, by our lifestyle, by our prophetic response to the injustices and the disharmony we see in the world. When we re are released from the shackles of our needs to serve other people. Instead of feed me, feed me, minister to me, minister to me, give me, give me, we serve and give to others. We follow Jesus in the garden when we're humble in the face of all legitimate authority of others as Jesus submitted to the authority of the Father and then to the authority of those into whose hands the Father delivered him. All this suggests, my friends, that we will be mighty in the Spirit only when we've been in the garden with Jesus. When we've said with him, with deep sincerity, Abba, Father, not what I will, but what you will, we know that this is impossible. It's the Spirit. It's Jesus in us 
by the Spirit who calls forth from our hearts, Abba, Father, let your will be done. Now I've stressed all of that because the essence of sonship is submission to the Father's will and we must understand the priority of the Father's will. We're still treading very high ground right now. We've come to a, a, a mountain top, but it's not just one peak or pinnacle. There are many peaks of equal altitude here. And we're stepping from peak to peak, and here is another peak that is, we're coming to. It is the absolute priority of the Father's will, and therefore sonship is submission to that priority and harmony with that priority and with that will. Therefore, we know that God's will is paramount, has priority. We know that God's will is expressed in Him taking the initiative of grace in our lives. And gospel obedience is response to that grace. The order is clear. The Father initiates, we respond. Before we can move one pace towards God, even when we are saying no to God, the Father comes to us in the Son and lavishes His free and overwhelming grace upon us. While we are saying no, while we are hammering the nails into the hands of Jesus in our rebellious Christ rejection, the Father is saying, I love you. Yes, my grace is operating. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How can any of us doubt the order? First, God's grace. Then, our response to that. Very few church leaders would, would disagree with that. But still, when we come to consider the work of the Spirit, many church leaders disagree with how this operates in terms of our will. And there's a lot of debate over which will comes first. God's will, our will. Is he willing first or we have to be willing first? And if we're not willing, does that make him unwilling? Or are we willing because our will surrenders to his will? Now, many pastors take different views on this and you must understand that, especially in the way the Spirit works in our lives. The questions are these. Is the Spirit's action in conversion and in our anointing is it free and unconditional? Or does the Spirit act in us only when we turn to Him and ask Him and allow Him to work? Question is, do we have faith because the Spirit has come and created that faith? Or does He come to us only when He finds faith already within us? What comes first? The moving of the Spirit or faith? Does the Spirit actually actively initiate faith in us or does He invite us and then passively wait for us in our uninflu uninfluenced freedom to turn to Him? And I've done it all, now I'm going to wait. It's up to you. Is that how it works? Those arms extended on the cross are extended still. He hasn't folded them. Those hands that were nailed to the cross were hands that received from the Father the promised Spirit, and He sent the Spirit into the church. He gave the Spirit to us. Why? For them, when the Spirit is come, He will convince the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. These are not hair-splitting academic questions which interest only armchair theological type Christians. They are practical issues which affect us in the way we relate to the Father and the way we live our Christian life. The question is, the central question is this, can the human will ever have priority 
over the Father's will. Now, since the time of John Wesley, it's been popular in many Protestant churches to claim that God's actions in us are conditioned by our willingness and faith. In other words, we must first be willing and first believe, and then God will act in us. Many leaders teach that the Father cannot bring the blessings of the Son and the Spirit until we have, by our own free will, opened the way for Him to do so. As a result, many evangelistic sermons appeal to human free will as the decisive factor in whether people are going to get saved. Now, when this is pushed too far, it can seem that at the pivotal moment, God suddenly becomes inactive and unable to help. He has to stand passively aside while we decide whether or not we will get saved. People apply the same idea to receiving the Spirit and His gifts. They suggest that Jesus cannot uh, anoint us with the Spirit until we have fulfilled the conditions that God has laid down. If we know enough, believe enough, repent enough, pray enough, seek enough, attend the course enough, buy the video, book, sweatshirt, and the lot, in the end we will be anointed. And while we laugh, and there's a humorous element to this, there's a tragedy here that is being played out in our charismatic churches today because it seems that many ministries are based on this false notion. In other words, you buy my video, you buy my sweatshirt, you buy my holy anointed handkerchief and all the rest of that stuff and then you will be anointed. They have made merchandise of the anointing of God which is the gift of God's grace. No preconditions. Only the Father's love and our response to the Father's love which came before we even thought about Him. <laughs> 